The fundamental theorem of calculus is a theorem that links the concept of differentiating a function with the concept of integrating a function. The first part of the theorem, sometimes called the first fundamental theorem of calculus, states that one of the antiderivatives also called indefinite integral, say f, of some function f may be obtained as the integral of f with a variable bound of integration. This implies the existence of antiderivatives for continuous functions. Conversely, the second part of the theorem, sometimes called the second fundamental theorem of calculus, states that the integral of a function f over some interval can be computed by using any one, say f, of its infinitely many antiderivatives. This part of the theorem has key practical applications, because explicitly finding the antiderivative of a function by symbolic integration avoids numerical integration to compute integrals. This provides generally a better numerical accuracy. History The fundamental theorem of calculus relates differentiation and integration, showing that these two operations are essentially inverses of one another. Before the discovery of this theorem, it was not recognized that these two operations were related. Ancient Greek mathematicians knew how to compute area via infinitesimals, an operation that we would now call integration. The origins of differentiation likewise predate the fundamental theorem of calculus by hundreds of years, for example, in the 14th century the notions of continuity of functions and motion were studied by the Oxford calculators and other scholars. The historical relevance of the fundamental theorem of calculus is not the ability to calculate these operations, but the realization that the two seemingly distinct operations calculation of geometric areas, and calculation of velocities are actually closely related. The first published statement and proof of a rudimentary form of the fundamental theorem, strongly geometric in character, was by James Gregory (1638–1675). Isaac Barrow (1630–1677) proved a more generalized version of the theorem, while his student Isaac Newton (1642–1727) completed the development of the surrounding mathematical theory. Gottfried Leibniz (1646–1716) systematized the knowledge into a calculus for infinitesimal quantities and introduced the notation used today. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Geometric meaning. For a continuous function y equals f x whose graph is plotted as a curve, each value of x has a corresponding area function a x, representing the area beneath the curve between 0 and x. The function a x may not be known, but it is given that it represents the area under the curve. The area under the curve between x and x plus h could be computed by finding the area between 0 and x plus h, then subtracting the area between 0 and x. In other words, the area of this strip would be a x plus h minus a x. There is another way to estimate the area of this same strip. As shown in the accompanying figure, h is multiplied by f x to find the area of a rectangle that is approximately the same size as this strip. So a x plus h minus a x approximately equals f x h Display style a x plus h a x approximately f x c d o t h. In fact, this estimate becomes a perfect equality if we add the red portion of the excess area shown in the diagram. So a x plus h minus a x equals f x 
H plus red excess display style a x plus h a x equals f x c d o t h plus text red excess rearranging terms f x equals a x plus h minus a x h minus red excess h display style f x equals frac a x plus h a x h frac text red excess h as h approaches zero in the limit the last fraction can be shown to go to zero this is true because the area of the red portion of excess region is less than or equal to the area of the tiny black bordered rectangle. More precisely, f x minus a x plus h minus a x h equals red excess h h f x plus h 1 minus f x plus h 2 h equals f x plus H one minus F X plus H two Display style left F X F R A C A X plus H A X H right equals F R A C text red excess H L E Q F R A C H F X plus H underscore one F X plus H underscore two H equals F X plus H underscore one F X plus H underscore two where X plus H one Display style x plus h underscore one and x plus h two display style x plus h underscore two are points where f reaches its maximum and its minimum, respectively, in the interval x x plus h. By the continuity of f, the latter expression tends to zero as h does. Therefore, the left-hand side tends to zero as H does, which implies f x equals lim h zero a x plus h minus a x h Display style f x equals lim underscore h to zero frac a x plus h a x h. This implies f x equals a x. That is, the derivative of the area function a x exists and is the original function f x. So, the area function is simply an antiderivative of the original function. Computing the derivative of a function and finding the area under its curve are «opposite» operations. This is the crux of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Physical intuition Intuitively, the theorem simply states that the sum of infinitesimal changes in a quantity over time or over some other variable adds up to the net change in the quantity. Imagine for example using a stopwatch to mark off tiny increments of time as a car travels down a highway. 
Imagine also looking at the car's speedometer as it travels, so that at every moment you know the velocity of the car. To understand the power of this theorem, imagine also that you are not allowed to look out the window of the car, so that you have no direct evidence of how far the car has traveled. For any tiny interval of time in the car, you could calculate how far the car has traveled in that interval by multiplying the current speed of the car times the length of that tiny interval of time. This is because distance equals speed times display style times time now imagine doing this instant after instant so that for every tiny interval of time you know how far the car has traveled in principle you could then calculate the total distance traveled in the car even though you've never looked out the window by simply summing up all those tiny distances distance traveled equals display style sum the velocity at any instant times display style times a tiny interval of time in other words distance traveled equals v t times delta t display style sum v t times delta t on the right hand side of this equation as delta t display style delta t becomes infinitesimally small the operation of summing up corresponds to integration so what we've shown is that the integral of the velocity function can be used to compute how far the car has traveled now remember that the velocity function is simply the derivative of the position function. So what we have really shown is that integrating the velocity simply recovers the original position function. This is the basic idea of the theorem, that integration and differentiation are closely related operations, each essentially being the inverse of the other. In other words, in terms of one's physical intuition, the theorem simply states that the sum of the changes in a quantity over time such as position, as calculated by multiplying velocity times time adds up to the total net change in the quantity. Or to put this more generally, given a quantity x that changes over some variable t display style t and given the velocity v t display style v t with which that quantity changes over that variable then the idea that distance equals speed times time corresponds to the statement d x equals v T D T display style dx equals v t dt, meaning that one can recover the original function x t display style x t by integrating its derivative, the velocity v t display style v t over t display style t topic formal statements there are two parts to the theorem the first part deals with the derivative of an antiderivative while the second part deals with the relationship between antiderivatives and definite integrals topic first part this part is sometimes referred to as the first fundamental theorem of calculus let f be a continuous real valued function defined on a closed interval a b let f be the function defined for all x in a b by f x equals a x 
f t d t display style f x equals int underscore a caret x f t d t then f is uniformly continuous on a b differentiable on the open interval a b and f x equals f x display style f x equals f x for all x in a b topic corollary The fundamental theorem is often employed to compute the definite integral of a function f f for which an antiderivative f f is known specifically if f f is a real valued continuous function on a B display style a b and f display style f is an antiderivative of f display style f in a b display style a b then a b f T D T equals F B minus F A display style int underscore a caret B F T D T equals F B F A. The corollary assumes continuity on the whole interval. This result is strengthened slightly in the following part of the theorem. Topic: <inaudible> Second part. This part is sometimes referred to as the second fundamental theorem of calculus or the Newton-Leibniz axiom. Let f display style f be a real valued function on a closed interval a b display style a b and f display style f an antiderivative of f display style f in a b display style a b f x equals f x display style f x equals f x if f display style f is riemann integrable on a b display style a b then a B F X D X equals F B minus F A display style int underscore a caret B F X D X equals F B F A the second part is somewhat stronger than the corollary because it does not assume that f display style f is continuous when an antiderivative f display style f exists then there are infinitely many antiderivatives for f display style f obtained by adding an arbitrary constant to f display style f also by the first part of the theorem antiderivatives of f display style f always exist when f display style f is continuous
Topic: <laughs> Proof of the first part. For a given f t, define the function f x as f x equals a x f t d t display style f x equals int underscore a caret x f t d t for any two numbers x1 and x1 plus delta x in a b we have f x 1 equals a x 1 f t d t Display style f x underscore one equals int underscore a caret x underscore one f t d t and f x one plus delta x equals a x one plus delta x f t d t display style f x underscore one plus delta x equals int underscore a caret x underscore one plus delta x f t d t subtracting the two equalities gives f x one plus Delta x minus f x one equals a x one plus delta x f t d t minus a x 1 f t d t 1 Display style f x underscore one plus delta x f x underscore one equals int underscore a carrot x underscore one plus delta x f t d t int underscore a carrot x underscore one f t d t Q quad one. It can be shown that a x one f t d t plus x one x one plus delta x f T D T equals A X one plus Delta X F T D T Display style int underscore a carrot x underscore one f t d t plus int underscore x underscore one carrot x underscore one plus delta x f t d t equals int underscore a carrot x underscore one plus delta x f t d t. The sum of the areas of two adjacent regions is equal to the area of both regions combined. Manipulating this equation gives a x one plus delta x f t d t minus a x one f t d T equals x one x one 
plus delta x f t d t display style int underscore a caret x underscore 1 plus delta x f t d t int underscore a caret x underscore 1 f t d t equals int underscore x underscore 1 caret x underscore 1 plus delta x f t d t substituting the above into 1 results in f x one plus delta x minus f x one equals x one x one plus delta x f t d T two Display style F x underscore one plus delta x F x underscore one equals int underscore x underscore one carrot x underscore one plus delta x F T D T Q quad two According to the mean value theorem for integration, there exists a real number C element of x 1 x 1 plus delta x display style c in x underscore 1 x underscore 1 plus delta x such that x 1 x 1 plus delta x F T D T equals F C delta X display style int underscore x underscore one carrot x underscore one plus delta x F T D T equals F C C D O T delta X to keep the notation simple we write just c display style c but one should keep in mind that for a given function f display style f the value of c display style c depends on x 1 display style x underscore 1 and on delta x display style delta x but is always confined to the interval x 1 x 1 plus delta x display style x underscore 1 x underscore 1 plus delta x Substituting the above into two, we get f x one plus delta x minus f x one equals f c delta x Display style f x underscore one plus delta x f x underscore one equals f c c d o t delta x. Dividing both sides by delta x display style delta x gives f x one plus delta x minus f x 1 delta x equals f c 
Display style FRAC F x underscore one plus delta x F x underscore one delta x equals F C the expression on the left side of the equation is Newton's difference quotient for f at x1. Take the limit as delta x display style delta x 0 on both sides of the equation. lim delta x 0 f x 1 plus Delta x minus f x one delta x equals lim delta x zero f c Display style lim underscore delta x to zero frac f x underscore one plus delta x f x underscore one delta x equals lim underscore delta x to zero f c. The expression on the left side of the equation is the definition of the derivative of f at x one. F x one equals Lim delta x zero f c three display style f x underscore one equals lim underscore delta x to zero f c q quad three. To find the other limit, we use the squeeze theorem. The number c is in the interval x1, x1 plus delta x, so x1 c x1 plus delta x. Also, lim delta x 0 x 1 equals x 1 Display style lim underscore delta x to zero x underscore one equals x underscore one and lim delta x zero x one plus delta x equals x one Display style lim underscore delta x to zero x underscore one plus delta x equals x underscore one. Therefore, according to the squeeze theorem, lim delta x zero c equals x one. Display style lim underscore delta x to zero c equals x underscore one. Substituting into three, we get f x one equals lim c x one f c Display style f x underscore one equals lim underscore c to x underscore one f c. The function f is continuous at c, so the limit can be taken inside the function. Therefore, we get f x one equals f x one. Display style f x underscore one equals f x underscore one, which completes the proof. Leothold et al. 1996. A rigorous proof can be found. Http colon slash slash www.imamath.com slash index. PHP options equals 438. Topic: Proof of the corollary. 
Suppose f is an antiderivative of f, with f continuous on a, b. Let g x equals a x f t d t display style g x equals int underscore a caret x f t d t by the first part of the theorem, we know g is also an antiderivative of f. Since f g topic zero, the mean value theorem implies that f g is a constant function i. E. There is a number c such that g x f x plus c for all x in a b. Letting x equals a, we have f a plus c equals g a equals a a f t d t equals 0 Display style f a plus c equals g a equals int underscore a caret a f t d t equals zero, which means c. Topic minus f a. In other words, g x f x minus f a, and so a. B F X D X equals G B equals F B minus F A Display style int underscore a carrot b f x d x equals g b equals f b f a. Topic proof of the second part. This is a limit proof by Riemann sums. Let f be Riemann integrable on the interval a b, and let f admit an antiderivative f on a b. Begin with the quantity f b minus f a. Let there be numbers x1, xn such that a equals x0 by 1 by 2 xn minus 1 xn equals b. Display style a equals x underscore 0. It follows that f b minus f a equals f xn minus f x0. Display style f b f a equals f x underscore n f x underscore 0. Now, we add each f along with its additive inverse, so that the resulting quantity is equal f b minus f a equals f x n plus minus f x n Minus one plus F X N minus one plus plus minus F X one plus F X one minus F x zero equals F x n minus F x 
n minus one plus f x n minus one minus f x n minus two plus plus f x two minus f x one plus f x one minus f x zero. Display style begin aligned f b f a and equals f x underscore n plus f x underscore n one plus f x underscore n one plus c d o t s plus f x underscore one plus f x underscore one f x underscore zero and equals f x underscore n f x underscore n one plus f x underscore n one f x underscore n two plus c d o t s plus f x underscore two f x underscore one plus f x underscore one f x underscore zero end aligned the above quantity can be written as the following sum f b minus f a equals i equals 1 n f x i minus f x i minus 1 1 Display style f b f a equals sum underscore i equals one caret n f x underscore i f x underscore i one q quad one. Next, we employ the mean value theorem. Stated briefly, let f be continuous on the closed interval a b and differentiable on the open interval a b. Then there exists some c in a b such that f c equals f b minus f a b minus a display style f c equals frac f b f a b a it follows that f c b minus a equals f b minus f a display style f c b a equals f b f a the function f is differentiable on the interval a b therefore it is also differentiable and continuous on each interval she minus 1 she according to the mean value theorem above f x i minus f x i minus 1 equals f c i x i minus x i minus 1 Display style f x underscore i f x underscore i one equals f c underscore i x underscore i x underscore i one. Substituting the above into one, we get f b minus f a equals i equals one. N F C I X I minus X I minus one Display style f b f a equals sum underscore i equals one carrot n f c underscore i x underscore i x underscore i one the assumption implies f c i equals f c i. 
Display style F C underscore I equals F C underscore I also X I minus X I minus one Display style X underscore I X underscore I one can be expressed as Delta X Display style delta x of partition i display style i f b minus f a equals i equals one n f c i Delta x i two display style f b f a equals sum underscore i equals one caret n f c underscore i delta x underscore i q quad two. We are describing the area of a rectangle with the width times the height, and we are adding the areas together. Each rectangle, by virtue of the mean value theorem, describes an approximation of the curve section it is drawn over. Also, delta x i display style delta x underscore i need not be the same for all values of i, or in other words, that the width of the rectangles can differ. What we have to do is approximate the curve with n rectangles. Now, as the size of the partitions gets smaller and n increases, resulting in more partitions to cover the space, we get closer and closer to the actual area of the curve. By taking the limit of the expression as the norm of the partitions approaches zero, we arrive at the Riemann integral. We know that this limit exists because f was assumed to be integrable. That is, we take the limit as the largest of the partitions approaches zero in size, so that all other partitions are smaller and the number of partitions approaches infinity. So, we take the limit on both sides of 2. This gives us lim delta x i 0 f b minus F A equals Lim Delta X I zero I equals one N F C I Delta X I Display style lim underscore delta x underscore i to zero f b f a equals lim underscore delta x underscore i to zero sum underscore i equals one caret n f c underscore i delta x underscore i. Neither f b nor f a is dependent on delta x i. Display style delta x underscore i. So the limit on the left side remains f b minus f a. F b minus f a equals lim delta x i zero i equals 1 n f c i delta x i Display style f b f a equals lim underscore delta x underscore i to zero sum underscore i equals one caret n f c underscore i delta x underscore i the expression on the right side of the equation defines the integral over f from a to b. Therefore, we obtain f 
B minus F A equals A B F X D X Display style F B F A equals int underscore a carrot B F X D X which completes the proof. It almost looks like the first part of the theorem follows directly from the second. That is, suppose G is an antiderivative of F. Then by the second theorem G X minus G A equals A X F T D T display style G X G A equals int underscore a carrot X F T D T now suppose F X equals A X F T D T equals G X minus G A display style F X equals int underscore a carrot X F T D T equals G X G A then f has the same derivative as g, and therefore f equals f. This argument only works, however, if we already know that f has an antiderivative, and the only way we know that all continuous functions have antiderivatives is by the first part of the fundamental theorem. For example, if f x equals e minus x2, then f has an antiderivative, namely g x equals 0 x f t d t display style g x equals int underscore 0 caret x f t d t and there is no simpler expression for this function it is therefore important not to interpret the second part of the theorem as the definition of the integral Indeed, there are many functions that are integrable but lack elementary antiderivatives, and discontinuous functions can be integrable but lack any antiderivatives at all. Conversely, many functions that have antiderivatives are not Riemann integrable see Volterra's function. Examples <laughs> 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 As an example, suppose the following is to be calculated: two five x two d x display style int underscore two caret five x caret two d x. Here, f x equals x two. Display style f x equals x caret two, and we can use f x equals x three three. Display style f x equals frac x caret three three as the antiderivative. Therefore, two five x 2 d x equals f 5 minus f 2 equals 5 3 3 minus 2 3 3 equals 125 3 minus 8 3 equals 117 
3 equals 39 display style int underscore 2 caret 5 x caret 2 dx equals f 5 f 2 equals frac 5 caret 3 3 frac 2 caret 3 3 equals frac 125 3 frac 8 3 equals frac 117 3 equals 39 or more generally suppose that d d x 0 x t 3 d t display style frac d dx int underscore 0 caret x t caret 3 dt is to be calculated here F T equals T three display style F T equals T caret three and F T equals T four four display style F T equals frac T caret four four can be used as the antiderivative. Therefore, d d x zero x t three d t equals d d x f x minus D D X F zero equals D D X X four four equals X three Display style FRAC D DX int underscore zero carrot x T carrot three D T equals FRAC D DX F x FRAC D DX F zero equals FRAC D DX FRAC x carrot four four equals x carrot three or equivalently D D x 0 x t 3 d t equals f x d x d x minus f 0 d 0 D x equals x three display style frac d dx int underscore zero caret x t caret three d t equals f x frac dx dx f zero frac d zero dx equals x caret three as a theoretical example, the theorem can be used to prove that a b f x d x equals a c f x d x plus c b F x d x display style int underscore a caret b f x d x equals int underscore a caret c f x d x plus int underscore c caret b f x d x. 
Since a b f x d x equals f b minus f a a c f x d x equals f c minus f a and c b f x d x equals f b minus f c display style begin aligned int underscore a caret b f x d x and equals f b f a int underscore a caret c f x d x and equals f c f a Text and int underscore c caret b f x d x and equals f b f c end aligned. The result follows from f b minus f a equals f c minus f a plus F B minus F C display style F B F A equals F C F A plus F B F C. Topic: Generalizations. We don't need to assume continuity of f on the whole interval. Part 1 of the theorem then says, if f is any Lebesgue integrable function on a, b and x0 is a number in a, b such that f is continuous at x0, then f x equals a x f t d T display style f x equals int underscore a caret x f t d t is differentiable for x. Topic x zero with f x zero f x zero. We can relax the conditions on f still further and suppose that it is merely locally integrable. In that case, we can conclude that the function f is differentiable almost everywhere and f x equals f x almost everywhere. On the real line this statement is equivalent to Lebesgue's differentiation theorem. These results remain true for the henstock kurzweil integral, which allows a larger class of integrable functions Bartle 2001, THM, 4.11. In higher dimensions Lebesgue's differentiation theorem generalizes the fundamental theorem of calculus by stating that for almost every x, the average value of a function f over a ball of radius r centered at x tends to f x as r tends to zero. Part 2 of the theorem is true for any Lebesgue integrable function f, which has an antiderivative f not all integrable functions do, though. In other words, if a real function f on a, b admits a derivative f x at every point x of a, b and if this derivative f is Lebesgue integrable on a, b, then f b minus f a equals a b f t d t display style f b f a equals int underscore a caret b f t d t this result may fail for continuous functions f that admit a derivative f x at almost every point x as the example of the cantor function shows However, if f is absolutely continuous, it admits a derivative f x at almost every point x, and moreover f is integrable, with f b minus f a equal to the integral of f on a b. Conversely, if f is any integrable function, then f as given in the first formula will be absolutely continuous with f equals f a e. The conditions of this theorem may again be relaxed by considering the integrals involved as Henstock-Kurzweil integrals. 
Specifically, if a continuous function f x admits a derivative f x at all but countably many points, then f x is henstock kurzweil integrable and f b minus f a is equal to the integral of f on a b. The difference here is that the integrability of f does not need to be assumed. Bartle, 2001, thm 4.7. The version of Taylor's theorem, which expresses the error term as an integral, can be seen as a generalization of the fundamental theorem. There is a version of the theorem for complex functions, suppose u is an open set in C and f, u c is a function that has a holomorphic antiderivative f on u. Then for every curve γ, a, b, u, the curve integral can be computed as γ f z d z equals f gamma b minus f gamma a display style int underscore gamma f z d z equals f gamma b f gamma a the fundamental theorem can be generalized to curve and surface integrals in higher dimensions and on manifolds. One such generalization offered by the calculus of moving surfaces is the time evolution of integrals. The most familiar extensions of the fundamental theorem of calculus in higher dimensions are the divergence theorem and the gradient theorem. One of the most powerful generalizations in this direction is Stokes' theorem, sometimes known as the fundamental theorem of multivariable calculus. Let M be an oriented piecewise smooth manifold of dimension n, and let omega displaystyle omega be a smooth, compactly supported n1 form on M. If M denotes the boundary of M given its induced orientation, then M d omega equals m omega display style int underscore m d omega equals int underscore partial m omega here d is the exterior derivative which is defined using the manifold structure only the theorem is often used in situations where M is an embedded oriented submanifold of some bigger manifold e RK, on which the form omega is defined. See also Differentiation under the integral sign Telescoping series Notes <laughs> <laughs>